Yeah. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. I'm Biola Lavi. I'm Tundra Biola. In another 17 days, it will be May the 29th and another oath-shaking date for the declared winners of the 2019 general elections in Nigeria. All things being equal, the occasion will effectively set Mohamed Buhari on his way to another four years as president. But the build-up to that event has not been a smooth one and continues to unfold under the specter of former Vice President Atiku Abubakar's legal challenge against the declared outcome of the presidential poll. Nigerians are simply holding their breath, not only because of that, but also ahead of elections into National Assembly leadership positions. Meanwhile, the military high command is still trying to crack the code of the deadly terrorist activities in the North. Is it troubled polity? And to help us look at the state of the nation this morning is Dr. Adi Tokumba Pierce, elder statesman and academic and public affairs analyst. You're welcome to the program once again. So Thanks for having me. Have you. Good morning. So we've said it is going to be a civilian to civilian transition once again. Um, flawed as de democracy is around the world, it has been said it is the best form of government. Um, once again, our, our democracy is flawed. We've just come out of an election in which everyone, um, including you, you were part or you came on during the elections to talk to us and we actually watched some of the monitoring together and you made commentary on that. And so we, we know that there is a lot of issues on the table ahead of this President Buhari's second term. For me, one of the things I wanted us to do is be a little bit reflective about our democratic process in general and really what we need to do to strengthen our democracy going forward. One of a couple of things that we need to do is strengthen our institutions. Freedom of expression is important in building a democracy. Freedom of association is important, rule of law civil service, the judiciary. I would like us to kind of go through some of these one by one and get your sense of how this administration has done, how Nigeria has done as a whole and a way forward. Because of the, because we're hot on the heels of the discussions around insecurity, I'd like us to start with rule of law. If you take a look at where we are today, what this president has done in his last term and what he needs to do, where do you stand on giving us a report card on rule of law? The, the nation has to rethink how it is structured and if the present structure should continue. If we have been through these last 20 years of this phase of Democratic disposition, <laughs> and we have had so many problems, mm. then we need to rethink. And this is why people like myself have always said restructuring is key. Let me give you an example as it relates to the security issue. The president met with the security chiefs and said, you must stop all this mess going on in the northern corridors. Too much insecurity, the kidnapping, the banditry, the violence, and so on. How do you stop it? That's the key. I remember the days of just say no to drugs. I mean, you just can't say no. There must be a system in place to make it possible for you to fight the problem. And that's why we say, there must be state police. I'll give you an example. The, the chairman of the Police Service Commission, mm. our own Musilio Smith, mm -hmm. a renowned police officer, retired, now said himself to the president and to the media that the police force in Nigeria is totally dysfunctional because they are not well trained, mm. they are not well armed, they're not well housed. They don't have the vehicles they need. And detectives are not even going for training. And guess what? The inspector general of police said something that is very revealing. He said that only 20% of allocations that have been approved to the police has been released in 2018. 20%. What do you do with that? We don't have enough police. The ones we have are not well trained. The police 
service commissioner, uh, commission chairman, is now saying they're going to withdraw troops, uh, they're going to withdraw police that, has, that are protecting private citizens. I mean, you're talking about this now? This is why we have all these problems. They don't have enough police, they are not well trained and so on. And that's why we said, if you operate from the center, as we do now, the president appoints the inspector general of police, the inspector general of police oversees all the security in the nation, it cannot work. This is why we have a federal system. This is why we have democracy. These things must be divided up into units. Every state must have control over its own security. This is why we had a problem in Benue and Plateau during the last, uh, you know, during 2015, 2016. There was so much chaos. How can a state make a law and not have enough police and the, the law to enforce that law? This is the problem. It will not work. You cannot expect federal police to enforce the law that you have enacted in your state, as we saw in Benue. It will not work. Therefore, the way forward is to decentralize the system. And that is where we're talking about restructure. Everything falls under that issue. Everything you look at is because too much power, too much work in the center, too much burden in the center, and therefore, nothing is working. But a few days ago, the president himself acknowledged well, tacitly acknowledged the limitations of the system, the unitary mm. system that we operate now. And he said we need to um, establish true federalism. Are you hoping, what are you hoping to hear in his speech on May 29th the regarding The president that? is a hypocrite, hypocrite in chief. He has said repeatedly that he does not believe in the 2014 CONFAB report and recommendation which recommends restructuring. Why is he now saying they're just words? Everything he has done, everything he has said. Let me give you an example of the hypocrisy again. When we were getting ready for this election, we all know, you in the media know, that there was a lot of proliferation of small arms in the country. Nobody stopped it then. The president didn't address the issue then. It was after the election when they have, these crooks have used the small weapons to win election for some of them, now they're talking about small arms proliferation. Now we want to stop it. It's all a lie. It's all hypocrisy. They are not sincere. If they were sincere, if the president was sincere about restructuring, he would have talked about it in his first term. He said it publicly. Front page punch, April 2014. Throw the report in the garbage. It makes no sense to restructure. There is still resistance to this idea very much in the north of Nigeria. Well, now that he does not have to appeal to the electorate of the north of Nigeria, since this is his final term, do you feel that he might return to that and actually address it like he has said he will? The record of this president does not give anybody encouragement to do anything right. A person who opens his own mouth and says, why do you want to govern? Well, my concern is for those who voted 98% for me and not the ones who voted 5%. That was the beginning of the end of Buhari. I don't trust him. Anybody who wants to trust him, good luck to them. He doesn't believe in restructuring. He doesn't have the capacity to or the interest to change anything. Tribalism, ethnocentric appointments, all of these things are rife. It, it doesn't make any sense. I don't believe him. But what we must do, whoever is going to bring about a change in this country's structure is the person that can lead us forward and achieve some progress and security for the country. What role do you think the Ninth National Assembly can play in restructuring? The Assembly is in confusion. The Assembly is heavily, heavily politicized. And if they are able to resolve the leadership issue within the assembly, let us see. But for now, for, from the past, what we have seen in the past, uh, there's been very little interest 
in bringing about real change. Because frankly, the way it is now, many of them benefit financially, they have a lot of influence, and they're happy with it. Until you get people, until you see, this is why the president is so critical. Because it is the president that can push this in the assembly. And then others will follow. Because nobody in the assembly, most of the people in the assembly are themselves, you know, appointees of, of, of one leader or the other from their state. So until we have a leader, a head of state in Nigeria, who believes that the structure will change, which is why people like myself have always supported Abubakar Atiku because of his commitment to restructuring. This is where I stand, unless we have a leader. It's not the National Assembly. National Assembly looks up to the executive. The president is all-powerful in Nigeria. And until that person becomes fully committed to the idea of real change, fundamental change, then I don't think we are going to make much progress. So, I mean, part of what we wanted to do today was really be reflective and possibly um, recommendations to the president, rather than, I mean, for well, us, I mean, that's where we are now. But um, I wanted to ask you about the word restructuring. Mm -hmm. um, two questions about that. Number one is, has it just become a political light, lightning rod now, where every side is using it mm -hmm. as a political pawn in a conversation? And the second thing, if we don't restructure in the next four, mm -hmm. during the second term, what are the dangers? Well, so the first thing is, is it now becoming a political lightning rod? No, it's just the term, just the term that has become so popular after the 2014 National Confab, uh, which was organized by the Jonathan administration mm -hmm. and which recommended a lot of things, uh, such as um, rotational presidency, uh, such as um, devolution of the economy um, so that uh, each state will have direct access to its uh, natural and mineral resources. As it is now, most of the resources of these states are in an exclusive list controlled by the federal the central government. These are the things that must change so that every state can actually develop its own economy the way it sees fit whichever international or national uh, partners they want to use. Look, look, this country is rich in mineral resources. Atiku has argued that the North is actually richer. These are facts. These are facts. Bauxite, beauty men, iron ore, I mean, uranium, all over the country. The point is right now, the country is dependent on oil. Only oil, 80% of, of our income, of our revenue comes from oil. Makes no sense. If these states have control over their resources and they're able to do business by themselves, then you'll have about 25 other minerals from which Nigeria will generate income. And Zamfara and uh, Sokoto and all these states will not be as dependent as they are now. They will all be very, very rich. Daraba, all of them have their resources. So this is what restructuring is about. So, so do we need a new word term. for it? Do we need a no, new no, word no, no. for it? Well, you can use other words. There are synonyms for it. Decentralization. Because know. it has been politicized. The word yes, restructuring yeah, has been yeah, politicized. But, but we, must not, we must not allow people to confuse the issue. The issue is decentralization, devolution of power. And then the whole issue of... Um, What's the word now when, you know, multiple, multiple resources instead of uh, just one, you know? So diversifying the economy, diversifying which is all the, the which have all been catchphrases over the last few yeah, yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, so but, but, see, actions yes. back then. Yeah, yeah, the, the point is people, you, if politicians will use words just as a word, and then they will not act on it, don't call it whatever you want to call it. You know, mm. whatever you want to call it, just decentralize. Give more power to the state. Follow the proper principles 
ideology of true, sincere federalism. As the president said last week, so I was asking you what would you would like to hear in his speech, notwithstanding the strong opinions that you have I don't want to hear expressed. anything in his speech. I want to see action. We've had enough speeches. Okay, Anybody what actions would you like to see in he this next four take years? take into the National Assembly and say, I want this country to be restructured along these lines. Let him provide the, the conditions. We want to decentralize. He has seen that Nigerians know. How can not West have seven states in that geopolitical zone? And Southeast, five. And the Southeasterners are clamoring for equality, for fairness, and they said that they disenfranchise. The National Confab recommends nine states per geopolitical zone across board. So that where you have seven, we are two more. Because there are many ethnic groups clamoring for more states in the country. These are parts of the things creating problems. So to address that issue is what the National Confab of 2014 did by saying nine states, where you have five, give them four more. And then somebody will say it's too small. The states in the US <laughs> that are 300,000 people. The point is, it doesn't matter so long as they are able to develop themselves and have a good quality of life. That is what is important. It is not the name or the nomenclature. It is the reality that matters. So if the president says today, forget restructuring, we're going to do devolution. Um, oh, no matter what he calls it. He'll be supportive. Going, we, we, definitely. We are good. And he has to take it to the National Assembly to make it into law so that states can use their resources to develop. Why do you think, you know how many states are, are now caught up in this, in this, uh, this uh, kidnapping and, uh, and violence and destruction in the North? You know how many states? Uh, you talk about the Kaduna, Abuja, Sokoto is caught up in it. Zamfara is caught up in it. Taraba is caught up in it. Kogi is caught up in it. The president's own state is caught up in it, Katsina. Until they kidnap the president of Nigeria, people will not realize how critical this issue is. But is the solution the creation of more states when, according to 2018 data, only 12 states in Nigeria have a revenue that's more twenty percent more than their the recurrent expenditure. The reason they don't have any revenue. Can I finish? Twenty percent more than their recurrent expenditure. I need to make it clear because we have viewers. So. The reason they don't have the revenue is because they don't have control of their resources. That's the point. That's the point. These states are just states on paper because they don't have control over their security. If you have your own security apparatus and you are not waiting for the federal government to give you police, which the federal government cannot, has not, will not, unless you allow the states to create their own system of police, as you have in federalism. Security and internally generated revenue. Mm. No, 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 they're not. They're not. Um. We're talking about empowerment. We're talking about functionality and success and progress. I'll tell you why. That's just one example. Now, link that up with economy. If you want to be clear about the economy, each state, if Zamfara is allowed to use its phosphate, its iron ore, and so many other resources it has to develop its own state, and it doesn't have to have the manpower. Once you have the resources, everybody will come from every part of the country, every part of the continent, every part of the world, to help you to develop your state, develop those resources. They will not be as poor as they are now. That's the point. Can you imagine on those states <laughs> with producing the third largest, has the third largest deposit of bitumen in the world, and is not able to use that to develop. In fact, it's not only on those states that will develop because of that, the whole of the sub-region will develop and so on and so forth across this country.
But that just still doesn't answer the question of creating more states. Why would we, it why answers should we create the question more? of giving power to the states. If you don't want to create sure. more states, give it to them as they are now. These are separate issues. But I'm telling you, there's clamor for more states. You can do more states if you think it makes sense. But the point is to develop the economy, give them the ability legally to use their resources and to negotiate their business to develop their own economy. Now, there's the issue that you raised earlier, which touches on budget performance, that damning report from the former IG, Alaji Musilu Smith, about how the police force is underfunded, mm -hmm. poorly equipped, poorly trained, and you were saying how 20% of their budget is cash backed. Now, regarding, regardless of how much resources you have, if they're misapplied, poorly used, poorly prioritized, there will be no progress. How do we address that as a nation, the quality of leadership that we have? First, give them the opportunity you cannot assume. As it is now, you have made it impossible for the states to function. I wrote a paper recently in one of the newspapers, in the Sun newspaper, Monday, um, Easter Monday, mm. on how restructuring can resolve the minimum wage issue. President said, you see what I mean by dishonesty? Oh, we approved it. First, the, the Senate president said 30,000 minimum wage, so that the president would not look bad. President quickly said, look, we approve it. Let the states pay 30,000. And then I look at it and say, how can states pay 30,000 minimum wage when they have not paid the 18,000 minimum mm -hmm. wage, most of them? And then we found out that most states are owing so much to the people. Well, some states have not paid pensioners in 36 months. But why are so you absolving no state governors who were given bailout funds all kinds of loans from the federal government, and only and half the of them were able to pay. Exactly. And when um, then Governor Tinubu had his imbroglio with then President Obasanjo, Lagos did not grind to a halt. So why aren't other? Go I mean, and then governors also stood up in a couple of days ago, commending the president and praising the president for the bailout and for the Paris Club. So what what responsibility falls on these governors? You see. Governors have responsibilities, they have their problems. I know people will say the security fund for some governors is so high. Mm. But the security fund, much as you may criticize the governors, is not supposed to be used to pay salaries. You know? The, 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 the state must be able to generate enough income. By the way, the business of bailout, if you know anything about economics, that is giving somebody fish, not teaching them how to fish, not allowing them to continually raise money, revenue. So you give them bailout today. OK, they misappropriate it. But then you give them bailout again. Why don't you let them raise their own funds and then let us see the yeah, bailouts yes. everywhere? Yes, Absolutely. but bailouts are But they cannot that. abdicate responsibility yeah. for failing no, to no, generate no, no, revenue no, no, no. for their state. You cannot, you cannot. But what I'm trying to say is the reality is this there is not enough money. You know, you got to give room. Everywhere in the world, there is corruption. There is a room for what. The governor is going to put aside, wrong as it may be. The only reason why other states and other countries survive is because after they have embezzled this and embezzled that, there's still enough. You mo and then there's rule of law, too. All of these things go together. You cannot separate them. One of the problems in Nigeria is that there's no control, no rule of law. People get away with murder. Well, actually, that's where the, that was and, my and first question thing you to talk you. About, you talk about governor's responsibility. Mm -hmm. If nobody's holding governor accountable, then, then what? what? So where does the blame for that lie? Who's going to hold the governor accountable? President. What about self-accountability? Mm -mm -mm. Look, in any establishment, 
Somebody, the buck stops somewhere. The president did not elect the governors, the people. It doesn't did. matter. It doesn't matter. Is the chief executive of the but country. But what is the what is the assembly for then? Exactly. What yes. are the lo local local assemblies? The for? assembly. The state the assembly. The, the state, state assembly. assembly. Yes. <laughs> the state assembly is itself part of the governor's whole corruption. Not all the time. Not all the time. Where they do their work, they are not. Where they where they don't, they are. But what we are so, trying look, to do, look, what look, I, sir, you cannot, sir, look, look, you see, this is a sir. I just want to. I don't want us. I, yes. I feel like I don't want us to go off track. What we're mm. talking about is the tools that we need to use to strengthen the democracy. Which means, if you are saying that the president has to call the governors to order. What is the role of the state assembly? If we don't start to let make sure that viewers understand the sure, different sure. tiers of government that have to call, that are responsible for accountability, we're never going to develop our democracy. That is true. That so is yes, true. ultimately there is a role for president, there's a role for peers, I mean, you know, peer sort of accountability, but there has to be a way that we are setting up our democracy. And if you could just say this is this is what we need. These are areas that we need to focus on. These are areas that the president needs to do. This is what the governors only, need to do. Only when the president's role is diminished, as it is now, as it is not now, that's when we have decentralized, mm -hmm. and the states have control over their own affairs mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. That you are going to be able to enforce that kind of accountability. Fair you see, enough. This is why we're saying, you know. Everything works together. I'll give you an example. Most state governments have an assembly that is controlled totally by the governor. Most of them. The assembly men and women are people that are basically agents, allies, and therefore, you have a problem there. I'm not saying they should be, they shouldn't be held accountable. I'm only telling you why we have the problem. Why we have the problem and why somebody else has to step in. This is unfortunate, but this is where the problem is. And once you have a head in a federal system, as we have today, that's why I always Put the book there. That's not to say you don't hold people responsible. That's not. Look, when you have, let us say, a local uh, INEC in every state, who appoints, this is, these are the things that must change. Mm -hmm. Who appoints members of that body? The governor. So he puts all his people there so that in an APC controlled state, Everybody in the electoral process there is APC. A huge flaw. But I want you to clarify. This must sir. change. Okay, look, another thing, the INEC. You know why INEC is so corrupt now? If the president of this country continues to be the one to appoint the chairman of INEC, we cannot trust INEC chairman. It will not work. These are things that must change. These are things that are contained in the 2014 confab recommendation. So there, you want change? You want to see how we can improve? These are things we must If I do. may come in here, there's that. But I want you to clarify before we move to that um, subject of INEC, which is a huge issue. Yeah. We just came off manifestly flawed elections. But <laughs> I want you to clarify when you say the president ought to step in, what does that stepping in entail? How would you envisage that when you say the president, since the State House of Assembly cannot hold governors accountable. Governors might not be able to hold themselves accountable. It ought to be the president. What should that look like? I, I want you to... Well, it is a question of making the case to the people, to the assembly, and not being himself overtly political. If you have what you have now, I'm talking about reality of our politics, a state government squandering the funds of the state, a state governor just abusing mm -hmm. his, his, his authority in the state. If that state is an APC state, I am sorry to say, you will not find a president holding that state accountable. 
If it's an, a, a PDP state, the president will make comments about that state. <coughs> and then when you do that, when you are so prejudiced, nobody takes you seriously. You cannot enforce the law as a president. You cannot actually make them accountable because you have jeopardized your authority by being prejudiced. This is where the problem is. Look, me, I, am one, I don't believe in individual goodwill because it may or may not work. Mm. You must use the system, the law, the structure of the law to make people accountable. Mm. Okay. So back to your point about the INEC chairman and the state recs and how they are appointed by the executive. Clearly, that has been disastrous in our recent elections. What system would you like to see? How should the INEC um, chairman and state recs be appointed? In, um, in Ghana, when we were getting ready for this last election, we had a visit from ECOWAS. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we had, they had many states give us ideas, countries give us ideas on how they do it. And other federalist governments, countries around the world, there's a way they do it. The, the board must be representative of the political parties, the major political parties, you know what I mean? Not 50 political parties, oh, the major 70. ones. How would right you decide now, the major ones? Is, does it depend on members, number of members? How do you determine the major ones? You number tell me members? who are the major political parties in Nigeria now. There are only two. We know who they are. So Based you're saying election, that it would be a two-party representation? It should be, yes. So, Represent, uh, so, that, so that within that group, they will be able to work it out. Make, so every party will be accountable. But in, I, in I state, mean, my question is, sorry, 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 I don't want you to. In the state. I don't want us to miss this, but yes, and that is also flawed inherently because of the movement that happens between the different parties. I mean, someone is in PDP today; they could be in APC tomorrow. So, if you have this panel of board members, and in between, before elections, they sort of move parties, what do you do? That's my challenge with sort they, of the, the recognition will, of only two parties. They will work it out themselves, as they always work it out. So you know you're no so longer... So you, as a member of SDP, would mm -hmm. be left out of that? Sure. And you're SDP, okay with that? Well, why not? You know the reason why? When we went to SDP, we believed we were going to be the third force, the alternative. Elections have shown that we couldn't make the court. Therefore, look, the reality is there are many two parties in Nigeria now. They're, so we're talking about if there were three, good. In the US, there are two. <laughs> there are two. It's not as if there are no smaller parties. But those smaller parties are not on the board of elections. Because those smaller parties are also affiliated with the two big parties. You, you, you get the point. But anyway, the point is that board in Lagos State, in any state, as I said before, the board of election is all members of the ruling party. It shouldn't be. In Lagos State, PDP should also be on that board. Equal membership. And within themselves, they will rotate the, cha the chairmanship. And the chairman is not a figure, it's not uh, an, uh, an authority or what we call it now. It's not going to just dictate to a uh, dictator to this group. So that's what that will create. Don't forget, democracy is not perfect, mm. but that's democracy. That's the, the best we can do. There must be fair. I mean, how do you conduct local government election in, in a state? It's coming up in Lagos, I believe, next year. When everybody on the local electoral commission is from APC. How is PDP going to get a fair shake there? Forget about it. It's over. That's why. And then the court system. <laughs> you take your case to court in a state. And all the judges are already appointees of, of, the, of the government. It's over. I mean, these are things that must change. I mean, you know that democracies, you will learn from other people. We learn how this thing should work. Fairness, equal representation. How can somebody say, today they are in APC, 
Tomorrow they go to PDP. But because PDP, right now, because APC is in power, and you have a legal issue, and once you get into APC, that legal problem is over. Now you tell me. And then you tell me who is responsible, the head of the party. I don't care what he says. We have seen what you're doing. You are covering up corruption, you are covering up crime for political reasons. That's what's going on in the country. So um, you touched on the judiciary briefly just a minute ago. I would like you to talk about the judiciary under this administration and what you would like to see going forward. Are there restructurings? Um, there's, been a, there's been wide criticism about the judiciary in Nigeria. I would love to get your opinion. If the judiciary that has the power of life and death can be trusted in a nation, I mean, where are we? It is, it is. Once you find the leader of a country interfering with the judiciary, it's over. It's the most disastrous thing that can happen. Look at what happened just before this election. I know the Chief Justice was flawed and his problems, but the way he was removed at the time he was removed and then replaced so that when the election come and their petitions, I mean, look at what's going on now. People are on judiciary boards who have clear conflict of interest. Come on, you must remove them. And with this background, though, you don't tell me they should remove themselves. Forget about that. Because they won't. Of course. No, they won't. <laughs> but with this background, your candidate proceeded to challenge the declaration of President Muhammad Buhari as the winner of the sure. 2019 election. Is that an exercise in futility, do you think? I don't think so, because uh, when there's life, there's hope. <laughs> we must keep hoping that when it gets to the Supreme Court, uh, hopefully they will do it. If Look, look, it depends on the facts. All we're saying is, if indeed, if indeed, Atiku has this record and more votes than, well, then let it be. In the meantime, those who have conflicts of interest should not be on the board that will determine that outcome. Because if they are, then it's all over. It cannot be fair. Let's look at the fight against terrorism, which has become a reality in Nigeria, unfortunately. Efforts have been made with limited success. What do you think is missing? The first and foremost, sincerity and honesty of leadership. I'm very passionate about that, integrity of leadership. For instance, um, you notice that Before the 2011 election, there was all this talk about, I think it was 2011 or 2015 election, this talk about um, if 2015, just before the 2015 election, that if Jonathan, if, if Jonathan wins this election, Inubu, Otimi Amechi, and a few other leaders of APC said they will form uh, another government. Hmm? Um, and some people also said that the dog and the baboon both will be soaked in blood. <laughs> Therefore, once you have that kind of situation, you are talking about promoting terrorism. And immediately after that election, Bukharam gained in strength again. Actually, it began in 2011. And this is what I noticed again now. I've seen it again. The pattern is there now. Before this last election, we were talking about arms coming into the country. Look at what happened in Lagos. They were using arms to threaten people. They were killing people. These guys were fighting all over the place. Nobody said anything then. The president didn't say anything then. 
immediately after the election, all those small arms that were used in the election and all those crooked individuals that were imported from wherever to come and do the election, now they are terrorizing us, just as Boko Haram did after the election. Now you have all these things going on in the North. After the election, all the arms, just like after the Civil War in Nigeria, you had arms everywhere. It took years before they mopped up those arms. Same thing after the, the Boko Haram. They were armed. They were encouraged. Then, after the election, they took to the streets. They became uncontrollable. Now, we have this new group, whatever their name is, we don't know yet. They are terrorizing the North. So nobody is going to escape this. You've got to stop it, and you've got to be honest with it. You cannot now say. You, you, you turn the other eye when, when it, was in your, it was in your interest to do so, and they were bringing the arms in, and they used it to support you. Then after that, you want them to just go away. They're not going away. Now we have more problems. So what you do, you've got to face it and be honest with it. What I said about the IG's comment was that only 20% of the allocation made to the police has been released to the police. That's another problem. Why do you... So the president will say, we are giving you 20 billion, and only 20% is released. Who should be held responsible for that? Tell me. Who? The, 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 the service chiefs who are waiting for the money? The president. Mr. President, where is the money for the police that you promised? Why are you giving them only 20%? and you're not asking questions, and you're calling the service chiefs and say, you got to do your job. What job? you got to stop this kidnapping. <laughs> How can they do it? The chairman of the police service commission says, police is not trained. Detectives have not gone to for any training. They don't have the proper arms. They don't understand the arms they have. They don't know how to use them. <laughs> they don't have the proper vehicles. Put it all together, the police is dysfunctional. Who's responsible? The government. They have not done what needs to be done. They shortchanged everybody. All the money they mopped up to do election. Instead of giving the money to the police, as an example, where is the money? Um, I want to I want to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about civil society. Part of building a strong democracy is around the role of civil society. Over the years, we have had less um, civil society voice has been less vocal as it hasn't been in the past. What would you like to see, and how, what engagement would you like to see civil society have in the next four years? Especially seen as we've heard, there's been different pockets of criticism around the world, especially from Amnesty International on the role on the a violation of human rights especially towards civil society? You know, members of the civil society are members of the community, just like you and I. And I think what has happened over the years is that government, after government, has in infiltrated civil society, brought people over, turned things around, and all we can say is you pray that individuals who are ready to sacrifice will come into civil society and change things. However, I believe that everything becomes possible if you have the right situation. Is civil society important in building a democracy? Oh, definitely. They're just like um, NGOs are very, very important to the economy. Very, very extremely important. But how do you build this if you have not built a nation? You cannot build these things. You know, you cannot build it unless we do the things we're talking about first. It is within that context that you will see civil society. Look at countries. What's going on in America now? You have a president who is under real fire because civil society groups the National Assembly, 
Everybody is standing up. But you know, when poverty is so rampant, when governance is so corrupt, how do you begin to tell a young person that they should obey rule of law? Every time I talk to students, they tell me, ah, don't worry, nothing's going to happen. So you can forge your certificate now. You can say, you can go and use somebody else's name and say you are this and, and nothing's going to happen. What will happen? Nothing. So unless these things change, you cannot have proper law enforcement in the country if the law enforcement is centralized. My God, can you imagine? You are North Carolina, you are waiting for police to decide what you're doing from Washington. So all of these things work together. Civil society will be stronger as our democracy gets stronger. And our democracy will get stronger once we are able to change the system and make it more workable. I'm not dreaming of uh, some, some angel coming from somewhere to come and change anything. I don't expect anybody who is looking for power or money to all of a sudden be a good person. But there must be a system in place. There will be thieves, there will be bandits, but there must be police and security apparatus to make sure that they don't get away with it as much as they do here in Nigeria. Well, let's look at the cabinet. The president is going to dissolve his cabinet on the 22nd of May, I believe it is. How would you assess their performance? Who would you like to see the president retain? And what kind of Nigerians would you like to see fill the roles, the vacancies that are coming up? Look, when my brother Raji Fashola was being appointed, I told him, that this, is, this can't work. This can't work. They're not going to allow you to do anything. So it depends. Again, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how competent you are. You have an executive that controls everything. So you are commissioner, you are minister for power. And some people who have influence over the president are bringing in generators. And you think they are going to allow you to do your job? One. Two, your minister for power. And there's problem in the Niger Delta area. <laughs> and everything is messed up there, and the vigilantes, and they're bombing everything, and you can't operate, and you can't really get enough oil and you breaking up gas pipes. What are you going to do? What does that mean? You know, there was the... In spite know, of all these challenges, yes. has there been any outstanding performance in the current cabinet? And is there any one that you would like to see? I don't back? know. I don't know. You don't believe that any area of Nigeria has moved forward with this current no. cabinet? No. No. I don't. And I don't believe it will unless we change things around. And that's why I am fully committed to restructuring. I will continue to talk about it, devolution, decentralization, diversification, continue to talk about it and see how far it goes. Sir, so do you have names of Nigerians that you would like to see in the upcoming administration's cabinet, or the, a type of Nigerian? No. What I would like to see is fair and just appointments, not based on ethnicity as we have now, not based on favoritism. Don't tell me this is my friend and therefore I'm appointing him. People who are qualified and who are committed and who have the experience. You know, if find them. If you want, you will find them. That's the point. Mm. If the president wants to find good people... He might not be able to find them. And if he's listening now, you haven't been able to give us any names or he any will characters. Find them. No, 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 please. But please. Let, me, let me ask you another question, sir. You will sir. find them if you want. It is... As an opposition, mm. what mm. do you believe your role is over the next four years? And how 
as an opposition are you going to be able to be constructive? Well, constructive criticism is what we have done today. The questions you've asked me, what do you think should be done? And you so have on and not so forth. been able to give the, you have not been do recommendations. We've asked you for a lot of recommendations. No, no, which one? You, we've been heavy on criticism. Besides restructuring, I'm you have been you on restructuring. I'm giving you recommendation in every single aspect. When we've talked about insecurity, you've elaborated on the insecurity issue, but there hasn't been any concrete recommendations. There are all these. Everything no, 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 you've no, no, said no. is macro. I said. Everything you no, said no, no, is no, no, macro. No, 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 no. I said mm -hmm. for security, it has to be decentralized. Once again, we're back to restructuring. Definitely. So basically, your solution look, look, for everything look, look, is restructuring. You cannot have security decentralized. Also, I said you must give the security apparatus the funds that have been allocated to them. That's the solution. Okay. So I gave you all the solutions. No, 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 sir. So I think as an opposition leader, your role over the next four years is going to be focused on restructuring. Is that right or as, am I wrong? As a, right. As okay. a way to develop the economy, mm -hmm. as a way to improve security, as a way to progress in education and every other aspect. You have to reorganize the structure as it is. You have built a building. Mm -hmm. You found that the foundation is faulty because every time you want to windows, what's going on with these windows? What's going on with the ceiling? What's going on with this? You find that you've got to go back and check your foundation. That's what we must do. We must continue as an opposition to talk about what must be done. And this is not just in opposition for the government in power now. This is also for us if we happen to get there, because you'll find me coming to do the same thing. If we are in government and we are not doing what we're supposed to do, we must also be self-critical. How can you have, you must have a gov a, an opposition that can provide a solution or suggestions in every respect. I just told you something now. You're asking me good people. That is one of the worst things you can do. Be naming names. Come on. Well, There's more so many characters. people. Oh, yes. All over the country, all over the world. I can tell you people, Nigerians who are excelling all over the world. And also, you must also be able to appoint people. Don't, they don't have to be in your political party if you really mean business. And if you want people who are sympathetic to your party, good. You, you can still find them qualified, fully committed, upright citizens who want progress and who are fair in their dealing with people. Thank you so much, sir. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thanks for having me.